Absolute pleasure. <laughs> I think nobody ever has given this kind of an intro for me, so I'm absolutely yeah. humbled. <laughs> I know that I've known you from 2014, 15, uh, something like that. Correct. And before almost a decade now. Yeah, but before you started leverage Edu, you know this is this one question comes in everybody's mind. If somebody who has done well in whatever startups and they have the skills and now they feel it's time to start something of their own, where do they start? The cold start problem hits them, right? I I think there are two types of people who uh, start a business. I think uh, A and those are the people that we are more familiar with are people yeah. who really fall in love with an idea and that's something within their DNA somewhere. Like that's all that they can really do. And second, I think people who are slightly more right brain and they look for the right business problem that they can kind of yeah. where they will make a lot of money and where they will make a lot of impact. Yeah. Uh, so I have a bias for people who are of the first category. Uh, but yes, there are enough people who essentially yeah. can spot an opportunity. They might not be related to it. So I think those people end up doing uh, great as well. So for me, yeah. it happened uh, more of the former, but slightly of the latter as well. You have need to have a really thick skin to be doing yeah. a business. Yeah. Uh, anywhere and mostly in India yeah. because some every day somebody's going to yeah. come at you throw stones at you every day there's going to be some new crisis people are going to say all kinds of shit for you yeah. some people behind your back some people in front of your back so if you don't have a very hard skin yeah. it's very tough to survive this no, absolutely. and it's very painful you know if you are an entrepreneur who is also successful um either you know your ego survives or your business does <laughs> so, <laughs> so if your business survived you you probably are a humble person yeah, yeah, yeah. that's like we see you have to accept humility sooner or later for Absolutely. sure but uh, before we jump into entrepreneurial side of things uh, i come from varanasi hello up boys yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my father sent me to to a good school because he was like uh, i just want my son to speak you know, it was the same thing with me but what what's the story let's jump in no my uh, my dad moved to delhi and when i was like toddler of sorts and uh, my father and mother's only dream in life was that i should be able to speak in english yeah. so my earliest memories uh, me behind my papa's bajaj chetak and he would uh, speak to every single kid who would ride from school buses in delhi and figure out uh, which kid is uh, speaking better english that's where i will put my wow. uh, guy wow. so yeah so so bingo there but uh, what where i'm coming down to is uh, today leverage adu is um, sending so many people abroad this year the number is slated to be about uh, closer to 20000 plus uh, in this calendar year uh, i uh, dreamed of going to uh, oxford and i did secure an admission to oxford said business school in 2013 uh, but at that point of time uh, uk did not have a post study work visa oh. so i got an admit uh, i applied to harvard sanford and wharton like every aspiring indian all three of them told me to f off <laughs> and then i got admission at said business school which is part of Their oxford loss. university yeah. nus and isb so i ended up going to isb which worked out well for me in life yeah. and i think that also made me realize that higher education abroad is not just about kind of going abroad it's also about uh, how the immigration laws work it's also about is this really going to add value or not and lastly i think something that you are a big propagator of i think it's important that education and i think 2023 or even like say couple of years back i think it means zero today i think they really care about a job at the end of the entire thing so i think our focus on day zero right from the day one was okay can we really put this person into a job that can really yeah. feed their families and a large part of our clientele today a large part of our students who are coming from Uh, tier two, tier three, tier four, India. Uh, these are people who don't end up uh, getting the lucrative opportunities that are out there in the country today. Yes, so yes. the idea also was to create opportunities for these guys. What made you, you know, go for that uh, startup bug? So in fact, Ayush, let me go uh, slightly uh, further back to say that uh, I wasn't as brave as people like you and Ritesh Agarwal are to start things right off the hook. Uh, I think I always wanted to be a founder. I was doing things uh, when I was in grade three. I was selling glass paper in my school. uh when i was in grade 4 i started a small club uh, i used to live in a government colony in delhi in connaught place and i started a small club where people would come in the evening play my board games have access to my comic books and pay me 100 rupees subscription fee and then did multiple things i told you about the sweatshirt thing i started a sweatshirt business when i was 16 years old wow. and then we started an event management company of sorts with another friend of mine so we did a lot of those small side gigs of sorts but was always figuring out uh, when is the right time to uh, go out and dedicate myself fully to something i think i got lucky at some point of time and started out leverage that that's so important to fall in love with what you what Correct. you want to do right a lot of founders today see fundraising as a milestone that if i've raised first round of funding that's some validation from the market right would love to understand the other side of this from <laughs> you no ayush i would say i'm a i'm guilty of that and i say this often i say this often to the folks who have backed me as well in the journey you should take vc for the right reasons you should not take a lot of vc 
probably say one round with the right backers and the right partners who really gonna be working with you to improve you as a founder to improve you as an individual to improve uh, how you look at a business how you'll grow a business i think the coaching part is really important within a vc ecosystem yeah. the money is not as important yeah. but if you find the right coach even with that first 100k 200k half a million dollar check they'll be able to kind of project your whole journey yeah. so if i was to go back in hindsight uh, of course i would have taken one or two checks but i would have largely avoided taking a lot of vc early on yeah. and would have rather uh, told a younger akshay from 5 years back that boss you figure out what dhanda let me specifically call it that what dhanda you really want to build yeah. and then maybe as you scale it uh, if you have a vc partner slash uh, somebody from the ecosystem behind you figure out how do you kind of scale it with the right uh, avenues with the right cost in by adding the right dose of technology and yeah. maybe raise p 5 years 6 years 7 years down yeah. and maybe then end up at the ipo milestone as a rich founder yeah. Yeah. if we can through any medium reach out to younger founders and tell them yeah. that boss don't chase these milestones are not important a line in the pink paper is not really going to change your life uh especially general writing about you and you tweeting about it or you putting an instagram post around it it's only gonna stick with you also for about one hour with everybody else for about 48 hours yeah. and then it really does not matter what really matters is you having a very solid business and uh, knowing yourself just yeah. by yourself that you're building a great business and at that at some amount of time it will have its value yeah. so customer customer money is the best money right customer money is the best money always was yeah. always is i think we are on the right path in india i think more founders are starting to realize this uh, so vcs will have to really up their game if they want people to take their money you did talk about wealth creation that wealth creation for founders is not tied to raising capital necessarily right in some cases it might be um but how does that math work for a founder who is starting out founders life can be romanticized from the outside but it is hard man yeah. because you are very far away from a market salary that uh, i would in fact say uh, the right backers the right investors the right vcs should encourage their founders to have enough cash in the bank so that they don't have to think about it at all and they have a comfortable livelihood around themselves and they're just focusing on the company's growth but i think a lot of people actually romanticize founders not making money and having a very shoddy lifestyle i think that's crap if the founder is uh, bringing in senior people who are making uh, a lot more money than uh, he or she uh, is i think that's good enough uh, they're demonstrating that they really want to kind of put the company first and everything else later yeah. but then it's somebody else's responsibility to take care of the founder's life as well yeah yeah <laughs> and founders also should not romanticize with uh, giving up things and uh, not thinking about yeah. uh, anything but building no, up because it's going to yeah. come back yeah. uh one year two year three years four years later and then you're going to say oh hey you know what crap yeah no 100% and, and and i also feel like in in my journey i did end up uh, you know like uh, finding some pride in 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 some struggle right? all of us and, do yeah. i'll just add something to that i think first time founders like you and me who come from outside the ecosystem we don't know better Yeah. So hence it is the responsibility of the ecosystem and folks who are essentially coming Too in educated. and advising us, backing us. It's their responsibility to ensure that you know yeah. what, you know what you're doing is wrong. Absolutely. Take care of yourself. If you are a founder and you are seeking VC money, what are you signing up for? I think it's uh, super important for anybody taking VC money to first understand how a VC works. You figure out okay how much money they have raised. uh how much they have returned back to their lp so what kind of pressure are they going to be in yeah. if you are the last check out of a certain fund uh they're going to come back to you much sooner uh for the return uh if you are in if you are the one of the first few investments out of a new fund you are slightly better off for none of their faults uh, vcs also are investing somebody else's money their money managers their wealth managers of very uh, yeah. extremely rich people in the world yeah. and uh, they have a certain responsibility uh to justify yeah. uh, those returns uh, that they promise and at the end of the day i think i've just like to add that you have to realize that vc is a very risky asset class exactly. so somebody is expecting very high returns from this yeah. and they're going to put all the that jacob pressure on you yeah. as an entrepreneur or as a team yeah. so, so so let's let's play a vc game here i am a vc who went <laughs> to you who is a limited partner and i'm seeking uh for money right so how much money am i supposed to return to you what's your expectation you know return me at least 3 to 5x uh because i am my uh, 
other money, my remaining 95% money, which I've invested in safe asset classes, and it's already giving me great returns, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40%. Uh, you mentioned VC is a very risky asset class, which means that out of, let's say, 100 investments that we make, how many companies would you expect to succeed and what's the return would you expect from them? Yeah. Uh, this person is going to be really fixated on their absolute returns. Yeah. And uh, hence, the VC, knowing that, okay, I have to give these XYZ returns, the only way they can make it happen is they either follow either of these strategies, either they're a late stage fund and they said, okay, you know what, I'm going to invest in 10 companies. Each of these 10 companies needs to give me three to five X returns. Yeah. Or I play early on and I bet on these moonshot ideas and uh, I'm, I know that, okay, only two of my hundred companies are going to be fund returners. Maybe three will essentially uh, be slightly high growth and maybe five will essentially give me my funds back and maybe 80, 90 will absolutely be duds and or may they might essentially be sell-offs and they might not have done me anything. So I know that at least knowing that uh, each of these hundred investments that I make have to be absolute moonshot and uh, they have to have the potential of being billion dollar exits. And hence, uh, when a founder would essentially come to this VC and they would say, you know what, I'm building a great business. It's going to make so much more impact and I'm going to make a really high profit. Sometimes this VC, despite lacking the entrepreneur, like despite lacking the founder, might not be able to back them because they will say that, you know what, you're not my moonshot. And I can't not back a moonshot because that's what I've signed up for with my LP. Exactly. So if these four or five companies are returning the capital for the failures of the rest 90, you must be expecting a really high return from these companies, yeah. right? Between 80 to 100x at the bare minimum. Wow. 80 to 100x as the bare minimum. And then probably a couple or three that are really did well. 800x is so also... So these are fund returners, right? Somebody would exactly. have put in a million, million and a half and it's yeah. going to take care of the $100 million fund. So yeah. you have to have a minimum return so that it takes yeah. care of the entire portfolio. Probably most of these people uh, who end up taking VC money, what they don't realize is that the rest 90 which failed also need to have the 500, 800x potential. No, correct. And the beauty of this is that each of those other 90 founders also had the capability of building a great business. But in chasing this random unicornish outcome, they lost their plot yeah. because uh, they had to do things which are not right for the business, which were not right, uh, right for the business model right from day zero. You know, like having VC money does not mean, okay, you have made it or not having VC money does not mean that you're shit, right? Like Absolutely. you could still be building a very meaningful business. At the same time, uh, there should be people who advise the founder, but don't impose their will on the founder. Because uh, a founder does know how to run their business to a very large degree, say 80-90% at the very least. Uh, and if they are allowed to take uh, risky bets, uh, that's what kind of really changes the business. I think an example that comes to my head is uh, Ease My Trip, right? And these guys have built such a fantastic business. And I was, I was having dinner with Prashant a couple of uh, weeks back. And uh, I think you must know about this as well. When COVID came in, uh, there were the only folks out there who refunded uh, all the money that was blocked. It was, uh, they said, okay, we know what we have X, Y, Z crores and internal accruals. We're going to use our internal accruals to refund all the money that is stuck money. for these guys. Even though our money is going to come in, it's, it's going to be working a bit of lag. Our money is going to come in in about five, six months. And uh, the customers came back in droves. They won their wow. trust. They won their trust for the longest time. And your example also reminds me of Paul Graham, right? He, <laughs> he mentioned that... Uh, there is the only uh, you know, competitor you should be afraid of is a company, no matter how big or small, genuinely cares about their customers because customers know. No, of right? course. I think you also said something very important that uh, as you scale, you should be worried about the founder who is super young right now, 16, 17 years old in a garage right now building a model to absolutely disrupt you. Yeah. I think as long as you live with that level of paranoia and keep trying to disrupt yourself as a business, I think yeah. that's where the large wins come from. That is amazing. You mentioned that if you were talking to a young Akshay, you would have educated him about private equity and spend time, have more ownership and work with a PE firm. I think the private equity structure works really well and that's why you have a large set of our companies over the last three decades who have scaled the business to a certain degree by themselves as entrepreneurs, as very fiery entrepreneurs, and then have had private equity come in and be able to kind of take them to the next level of growth as partners, as growth partners, as uh, risk sharing partners, as a specific project uh, partners. Mm -hmm. I think that model works really well for the Indian sensibilities as well. Uh, and I think at that point of time, you have done your fair share of mistakes. Uh, you have fallen down enough and uh, you have had enough chances of kind of knowing what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. You're able to also ensure that the investor is a partner and not your boss. Yeah. 
I think the role of an investor is very well suited and uh, very well aligned at a private equity level mm-hmm. as compared to a VC level sometimes. If if I'm building a business which I'm trying to figure out whether it's a better fit for PE or VC, what's the difference? What should I look for? I think growing profits, uh, well recurring cash flow, uh, identified customer set, large time, knowing it okay. Uh, so I think as long as you've built out that business model where there is absolute predictability in terms of cash flows, right. they're able to also build predictability in their model about uh, the kind of returns that this will give me over a yeah. three, five, seven, eight year time um, horizon. Uh, but more importantly, uh, they're going to make an investment after a lot of sound reasoning and a lot of sound logic because yeah. they don't want to re- lose money on every si- any single of the investments. Yeah. They really make sure this is going to give me X returns. Yeah. I don't want like moonshot returns, but I want these XYZ returns, which I've really promised my investor set. Yeah. And uh, only then can I go out in the market and raise my next fund. Yeah. Uh, so it. for them, that credibility, that predictability becomes super, super important. As a founder, you are selling all the time, all the time, 24-7. What is one time where you felt that things are not going right, but you had to hold the ship together? I felt like this almost on a lot of days of my life for the last six to six and a half years as we've been building leverage. But and I, I remember one of these guys who was one of our early investors uh, sat me down uh, one fine evening of a beer and said that, you know what? Uh, you are the founder. Not everybody else is thinking like you are thinking. So don't expect them to do what you are doing. Because if you do that continuously, of the 11 folks that do work for you, who work with you, they're all going to run away. I think that was a very light bulb moment in my life. And uh, I think at that point of time, I realized that every time you're working with somebody, uh, you can't expect them to make sense out of nothing. You can't expect them to be absolutely optimistic despite shit breaking down every single morning. You have to give them structure. Uh, you have to give them very specific tasks. You have to give them very realistic milestones about which they feel great, about which they kind of, uh, what they celebrate, what they look forward to. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think that really uh, graduates into uh, a, a founder really, really, really obsessing about culture. Because if you build a good culture where people are happy, where people are looking forward to tomorrow, where people are thinking about, hey, you know what, the company's going to take care of me. I think uh, that trust, uh, people uh, repay back the trust in like 10, 20, 30 times. Uh, And I think as you graduate further out, it's super important that uh, you find the right peer partners who can hold that uh, horse for you. For me, what has worked is I always have thought of uh, your workplace needs to be fun. We are thinking about... uh, uh, how can we bring more fun people? Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't think about how do we bring a, a more average, uh, uh, intelligent person out into the group. Yeah. But I think there's, we're always doing a check mark around, is this person fun to work with? If they're fun to work with, of course, they're going to be having a good yeah. time at leverage and they're going to be really adding into our yeah. DNA. That is amazing. I want to ask you about one story where as an individual, as a person, because of your something which you lacked or a mistake you made, uh, you fell in a ditch and the story ends there. <laughs> Is there a story like that? There are stories, I don't think it's I think as a founder, you really obsess about zero to one products and you think uh, you should do this too, that too. Uh, we have tried multiple products because you're saying that okay, we remain in the ditch, uh, which even today people see value. People say that, hey, you know what, Le- yeah. why, did leverage, why does leverage not do this and this and this? <laughs> and they don't realize that we have already tried this, this and this and failed at it. I think what that did to us as a DNA is that it built a culture of experimentation that we're Mm -hmm. super proud of. Uh, Our core businesses today are a product of some experimentation that we did about uh, just before COVID. And a lot of other things that we're doing right now, 20% of our business is financial services. We give loans, we do remittances. It's all, it all started as an experiment. Kind of scale from 30 CR an year to now about about 700 CR an year in terms of loans that we give out. Oh wow, that's that's more than most fintechs. (laughs) But coming back to the topic, I think failing is great. I think as long as it uh, builds a mental muscle of you trying to do the right things as you move forward in the future. How do you find that right person? What are the things to look for? How do you decide to build a business together with anyone? I think I've been super lucky. Uh, Everybody I work with, I know them from my previous life. They're all friends. Uh, Digvijay, who's my chief operating officer, now my co-founder, he and I go back to about a decade back. Wow. When he used to be the guy who was responsible for me passing my exams in business school. Uh, Rachid Anom since 2008, who's building a financial services vertical at CEO of a platform business. I know him for the last, we did that uh, selling uh, hoodies together uh, back oh, in the wow. day, doing all those funny things uh, about 15 years back. 
uh, Aman was my vendor when I was first thinking of starting up in 2012. Wow. So over time, of course, I got lucky and brought these guys into the company. I think as we now move forward and try to get uh, other people, other leadership in the company, I think one thing that really works well is uh, if this person has uh, demonstrated execution in a larger setup like that before, uh, and uh, B, like I said, uh, that plus are they fun? Every time I've kind of checkmarked against fun, that's always worked out for some reason. <laughs> so uh, I'm a big believer in the fact that uh, company building is not easy. Like Elon Musk says, it's like eating glass. I think the one advice that I give to all university students is that don't focus on the grades as much, don't focus on anything else as much, but make sure that you walk away with a 200, 300, 500 people contact book. Uh, because the people who you are within college, they're going to open doors for you wherever yeah. you move in life. So make sure you know anyone and everyone. So I'm a big believer of the fact that uh, invest in building long-term relationships with long-term people and uh, the compounding that comes off from it is absolutely magical. It's incredible. You mentioned branch learning and people going for specialized courses and stuff like that. Uh, if you can share, what are like the top three courses people are going for these days, uh, which, you know, data says, but we don't usually expect apart from the normal ones. I'm sure you can judge the first one. So I think 21% of all our folks uh, last year went for data science programs. Got it. We, we work with uh, one of these universities uh, in uh, Southeast Australia. They have a course in marine biology. So they marine actually, biology, yes, wow. So they actually, uh, three times every week, the student has to scuba dive as part of the program. Wow. And study corals and study the aqua life. And uh, 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 most folks who graduate out of this program, if they decide to kind of, if they decide to follow this through and through, they end up working in Antarctica. A course in wine making in a university in Scotland uh, that is wow. again a partner of ours. Maybe the last one that I have for you is... Uh, Again, uh, going back to sports analytics, we have universities who are specifically focused on this uh, with, wow. with a very practical curriculum across the world. And then you get a guaranteed internship at one of these colleges with Chelsea Football Club for eight months. You know, any of this, these courses, I did not expect at all. If you were in your early 20s today, hmm. what you would be doing if not Leverage Redu? I, I think I would have just done a different version of Leverage Redu. Uh, possibly it might have been, uh, it could be different versions of it, right? It could be creating uh, new age colleges uh, in the country. Uh, our own version of maybe we can't do marine biology, but we yeah. can do a bunch of other things in Absolutely. India. And uh, maybe something, but, but it, it would be something in the higher education space. People who don't come from anywhere can find a great footing for themselves on, yeah. and are able to kind of ensure that family get success to a better life as they progress in their life. Thank you so much, Akshay Bhai, for taking out all this time and coming all the way to record this podcast. I'm sure it will... Uh, help many other founders. It did help me find answers to a lot of questions which I wonder about. Uh, no, thank you, Ayush, for hosting. Uh, this felt absolutely warm. Uh, thank you for making uh, the ecosystem brighter with what you're doing. And uh, I'm a massive supporter as always. Absolute pleasure to host you. Cheers.